Madam Chairperson, Cabinet colleagues, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, and most especially my dear comrade sister, the Ambassador of the Republic of Cuba to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Vilma. It's, it's good to see you again. The senior public servants and members of the police, senior ranks of the police force, and uh, Cubans who are here, and members of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cuba Friendship Society, and students, and other persons who have been invited. I, I think the API has a very good film, and I want personally to congratulate them. The, the, I have one regret about the film, though. When I saw myself in 2001 with Fidel, I wish if I can look like that again. <laughs> but when I was a boy, they said that there are four things that come not back. The spoken word, the sped arrow, the pastime, and the neglected opportunity. Of course, that's the days before technology, advanced technology. There are some other things I understand that come not back um, in a more modern world. But those are the four that I knew about in primary school. I, I want to structure this talk by making an in some introductory comments, by speaking specifically about the circumstances and the actual establishment of diplomatic relations in 1992, and then to speak about the relations in the first nine years between 1992 and 2001, and then to look as to what has happened after 2001 to the present time, and then to make some final comments. I, I have um, prepared a text. I will read to the text, not everything in the text, um, because I'd like to make it available for people, students, and the like. I, I, I don't have, I'm no, over 70 years old, and I'm very conscious that I have less and less time remaining on Earth. And therefore, I, I want to give up my experiences and what I've gone through in this particular case, the relationship with Cuba, because I've been a witness to it from the very beginning and a participant, so that future generations would be able to have some perspective as to the way it was. So, my introduction. As we know, on May 26, 1992, Cuba and an independence in Vincent and the Grenadines established formal diplomatic relations. And over the past 25 years, these relations have metamorphosed from elemental to deep and enduring. Prior to our country attaining independence on October the 27th, 1979, the colonial power Britain that had responsibility for our country's foreign policy and diplomatic alignment, they had long-standing diplomatic relations with Cuba from the time of Cuba's independent nationhood in 1902. And prior to that, prior to 1902, Britain had links with Cuba through its relationship with Spain, which had colonial suzerainty over Cuba since the late 15th century. Between 1910 and, and into the 1930s, dozens of Vincentians migrated to Cuba to work, mainly on sugar plantations. Among them were my paternal grandfather, Augustus Gonzalez of Bayer Hill, and one of my mentors, an old man, very poor, poor as a church mouse, Mr. Doyle of Connery. The birth of the revolutionary Cuba on January the 1st, 1959, 
under the leadership of Fidel Castro's July the 26th movement, ushered in a new era of regional hemispheric and global relationships for Cuba. Fidel's declaration in April 1961 that Cuba was embarking on a socialist path by way of the guiding ideas of Marxism-Leninism solidified its anti-colonialism, its anti-imperialism, and its socialism as bedrocks in its foreign policy. This socialist and Marxist-Leninist declaration shaped Cuba's embrace of revolutionary movements in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and secured for it a place in the world communist orbit headed by the, Un the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, the Soviet Union. Between St. Vincent and the Grenadines, independent status of 1979 and its establishment of formal diplomatic ties with Cuba in 1992. The practical links between our two countries at the governmental level were minimal and these were restricted to a few scholarships, some assistance from Cuba at the time of natural disasters and minimalist trade. However, the non, at the non-governmental level, there were much more solidarity bonds, particularly consequent upon the Grenada Revolution of March 13, 1979, and Cuba's closeness to that revolutionary process. Renrick Rose alluded to that uh, about the earlier advocates. In this period, the earlier period when there was very little government-to-government -government contact, that's between independence and 1992, when diplomatic relations were established. The non-governmental relationships were largely forged between the socialist-oriented Yulu United Liberation Movement, Yulu, a small Marxist grouping established in 1974, and its successor umbrella entity, the Radical Social Democratic United People's Movement of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on the one hand and the Communist Party of Cuba on the other. The leadership of both ULIMO and UPM visited Cuba on several occasions. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Cuba Friendship Society was established and many university and political training opportunities were made available for Vincentian students to study in Cuba and these were taken up actively not only scholarships, but also activists from these two organizations. Esteemed Vincentian professionals, such as Dr. Douglas Slater, Donnie DeFreitas, Thornley Myers, Andres Wickham, Yvette Barnwell, Bernard Buck Hamilton, and Dexter Rose, were among those Bowen King, among those who attended universities in Cuba in the earlier period after St. Vincent Grenadines gained independence in 1979. Let me just pause to say this. Douglas Slater was medical officer of health, and subsequently minister of health, is now the assistant general secretary, assistant secretary general, sorry, of CARICOM. Andrews Wickham, reached the level of permanent secretary, an economist. He is our ambassador in Venezuela. Yvette Barnwell, his wife, you know as Yvette Wickham, but she's a Barnwell, she studied accounting in Cuba. She is a senior public servant in this country and, at, and in Venezuela currently she is the minister counselor at the embassy, our embassy in Caracas. Bernard Buck Hamilton is, is the Mr. Hamilton at the Bank of St. Vincent who manages our money there. Dexter Rose is our first ambassador to Cuba and is a senior executive at Vinlec today. Donnie De Freitas works in the Pacific but he was the first head executive head of ECTEL, the Eastern Caribbean Telecommunications Authority. And 
These are persons, when they went off and to understand the climate, they asked them if they were crazy, where they will get work. Huh? I just want to, and all these went without government. But there are others too, I, I, I name significant ones. And then of course, there are several persons who went to do political work. Um, I wouldn't call their names, but there are some here and also in New York. After the initial exodus of young scholars for training in Cuba through the hospitalities of Ulimo, UPM, the Labour Party government under Milton Cato sent a few students to Cuba, for instance, Les Grant, who subsequently became the chief agricultural officer from South Rivers. He went to study stuff on sugarcane technology so that he can come back and help Vince Beach with the reintroduction of the sugar industry. And of course, under the end, the, the, during the the, the, then afterwards, the NDP under James Mitchell, who sent more students to Cuba by way of an intergovernmental agreement. The development of the relations between Cuba and SVG cannot be seen outside of the context of the following five factors or considerations. First, the location of both Cuba and St. Vincent and Grenadines as part and parcel of a wider Caribbean civilization in geographic, historical, and cultural terms. Two, the evolution of or changing nature of the internal political dynamics in both Cuba and SVG. Thirdly, the history of disengagement and engagement between Cuba, the Western Hemisphere, and the Caribbean community, CARICOM. Fourth, the altering and altered character of the global political economy, including shifts in the USSR and the USA, and the consequential impacts on both Cuba and our country. And fifth, the leadership personalities in the solidarity embrace between Cuba and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I shall weave the analysis of these five contextual factors into the textual consideration of Cuba SVG Relations, and if I if I may just say this, that the last factor about leadership personalities, I want to make the the basic point that though leadership is of great significance, and we must never downplay it, and leadership has to take advantage of opportunities which exist and which certain persons may not otherwise see and to run with them, so to speak. We must never forget that leaders by themselves do not make history. Leaders make history, but only to the extent that the circumstances of history permit them so to make. But leadership is nevertheless important to take advantage of the opportunities in the making of that history. But they're constrained always by circumstances. But first, let us remind ourselves briefly about some relevant factual matrices of both Cubans and Vincent and Grenadines. Let's get some facts right, or some facts up front. Cuba has a land area of 42,426 square miles and a population of 11 million people. We have a land area of 150 square miles and 110,000 people. Cuba thus has a population a thousand times our size and a land mass which is over 280 times the physical size of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Cuba for all the negative commentaries you get, it has a higher ranking than St. Vincent and the Grenadines in terms of the Human Development Index, in fact, higher than most countries in the Caribbean. 
Although both countries are grouped in the higher level of the middle income developing countries, and both are classified as small island developing states, these are all relevant factors in the consideration of our relationship. Cuba was a colony of Spain, as I said before, from the 15th century until the Spanish-American War of 1898, which led to its nominal independence. But Cuba was structurally and politically subservient to the United States from 1902 until the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Our country is a British colony in one form or another from 1763 until our independence in 1979 save and except for a few years of French rule in the late 1770s, early 1880s. Cuba and SVG have endured European colonialism, neocolonialism, and neocolonialism, although their paths have been different in important respects. Cuba, of course, has been bombarded continuously since 1959 by the forces of imperialism which fact has profoundly shaped its political economy and society. At the same time, Cuba and our country are in quest of our people's development and in accordance with the path chosen for ourselves and in Cuba's case for themselves. In that regard, we share important goals grounded in the core values of our Caribbean civilization. I turn now to speak about the establishment of the diplomatic ties. Cuba and SVG established diplomatic relations nearly 20 years after four independent English-speaking Caribbean countries, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago, established formal diplomatic ties with Cuba in December 1972. I have told the story of this path-breaking and courageous move by these four CARICOM countries, Caribbean countries, they were not yet CARICOM. CARICOM came into being in July 1973. But they were in Carifta, the free trade area. I've told the story about how they established their relations in, a, in, a, in an essay in a, in a, entitled The U.S.-Cuba Accord, How CARICOM Paved the Way, published in a book which I authored it's recently published in 2017. The book is entitled Our Caribbean and Global Insecurity. You can get it on Amazon. St. Vincent Grenadines' opening of diplomatic relations with Cuba came to 13 years after the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada under Morris Bishop initiated its diplomatic nexus with Cuba in ways unprecedented in the English-speaking Caribbean. By May, 26, 1992. It's a day I always remember because the, the woman who said I do to me was born on that day, May, not 1992. <laughs> <laughs> the 26. By May 26, 1992, St. Vincent Grenadines established formal diplomatic links with Cuba. When it did so, it had become overwhelmingly acceptable in the Western Hemisphere and globally that the American attempts to isolate Cuba diplomatically and politically were untenable. By the time we did it, the Americans had lost the argument. But of course, in politics, even though you lose the argument, it doesn't mean that you win the opinion. And I always try to tell my colleagues the best thing to do is to win the argument and the opinion. And in politics, often it's preferable to win the opinion now and the argument a little later. Because the opinion reflects itself in the ballot box more than the argument, though that they're not disconnected. The majority of states, member states of the Organization of American States, had by then, had by 1992, formal diplomatic relations with Cuba, including Canada and most Latin American countries, which had themselves voted to expel Cuba from the OS in 1962. By 1992 also, Cuba had backed away from its earlier active and enthusiastic support of revolutionary movements in Latin America, even though it continued to provide solidarity and some 
material assistance to them, though markedly reduced. Washington itself, that is to say, headquarters of the U.S. government, itself acknowledged a significant diminution or lessening of what the USA itself had been calling, quote, the Cuban project for the export of re revolution, unquote. Still, the USA maintained absurdly the illegal economic blockade against Cuba, even in the face of an overwhelming near unanimous rejection of this illegal blockade annually by the General Assembly of the United Nations. The USA continued to label Cuba quite wrongly as a state sponsor of terrorism, and it maintained still its 1962 break of diplomatic relations with Cuba, and it continued to advocate quite aggressively for regime change in Cuba. All that still up to 1992, even though in the hemisphere and globally, nations and peoples across the world were seeing that their attempts to isolate Cuba politically and diplomatically was untenable. That those attempts were not, no longer very serious. Serious for Cuba, but not as a serious public policy. It was not until December 2014 that the American President Barack Obama restored formal diplomatic links with Cuba in the wake of its removal of Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. That's what they called it, state sponsors of terrorism. Still, the economic blockade has remained despite the easing of some travel restrictions of Americans visiting Cuba and the loosening of some of the most egregious barriers for its citizens' engagement with Cuba. So despite the fact that in 1992 the international and hemispheric tide of history was shifting against American policy of diplomatic and political isolation of Cuba, it was nevertheless still courageous of the government of a small country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in America's proverbial backyard to open formal ties with Cuba. That is why Renrick gave due recognition to Sir James. And I will give him due recognition today also. By the way, if I say parenthetically, and I don't want to introduce partisan politics in it, but at my age, I have to talk the truth as I see it. I went to an event of the ambassador's house. The opposition was invited there. Part of the commemoration, they didn't turn up. The ambassador can't say that. Because she can't get herself involved in our domestic politics. But I could say that. When I left, they didn't, I stayed an hour there. I had to go away. And I inquired afterwards whether they had come. There was an event on Thursday evening. I inquired, and none of them attended, although they were invited. And today, to the best of my knowledge, none of them is here. If anyone, any one of them is here, they can put their hand up, so that I'll apologize and say that I've made an error. But the man who led the opening of the diplomatic relations was the founder of the New Democratic Party. So though the tide of history was changing against American policy in the hemisphere and globally, as I say, it was nevertheless still courageous for this country, in America's proverbial backyard, to open formal ties with Cuba. To be sure, it was not a metaphoric seismic political event of the kind of diplomatic opening in 1972 by the Carifta Big Four, Barbados, Jam Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. But Sir James Mitchell deserves credit for asserting our country's independence and sovereignty in, formalizing of, in the formalizing of diplomatic relations with Cuba on May the 26th, 1992. I inquired, of course, whether Sir James was invited to these events, and I was informed that he was away from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I think he had a medical issue. 
wish him well, physically and otherwise. To appreciate Sir James's bold, courageous move, it is important to recount a few episodes of active political pressure on CARICOM governments in the 1990s to tow the American line on Cuba. I want us to retrace the history broadly, including the context. Notice, I'm giving him credit. I'm saying it's not a seismic event as the one in 1972, 20 years earlier, but still, even though it was taking place in a context which, where the arguments were, were shifting against the United States in respect of the isolation of Cuba politically and diplomatically, still, the US was acting in certain ways to pressure the Caribbean countries not to engage Cuba. And it's important that we put it properly so we understand, because there are people who will say, I shouldn't be doing this work for them, you know. I'm talking politically. They should be doing this. But I'm interested in history. And I'm interested in us all, of whatever political persuasion, strengthen and fortify the relationships between two countries which are part of our Caribbean civilization and where we have so much in common. I read a paper by a professor, H. Michael Erisman of Indiana State University wrote this paper in 1994 entitled Evolving Cuban-CARICOM Relations, a Comparative Cost-Benefit Analysis. He presented this paper, you may look, look it up, he presented it at the 1994 Annual Conference of the Caribbean Studies Association in Merida, Mexico. And he labeled, this professor labeled the post-1992 Cuban initiative in CARICOM as a peculiar courtship, a peculiar courtship. That's his formulation. To which he contended that CARICOM's response was even more remarkable, again his words, more remarkable. Erisman astutely observes this, quote, previously the cultural ideo ideological differences that distinguished the English speaking Caribbean from Cuba combined with concern about U.S. vindictiveness, would likely have served to thwart any serious engagement. But clearly, the phenomenon of the new international political order that has attracted so much attention at the global level has arrived in the Caribbean. One of its most dramatic manifestations being the willingness of the CARICOM countries to embrace Havana's integration efforts despite Washington's threat of retaliation, unquote. Among Cuba's overtures to CARICOM was its request for an official observer status in this August body. Yes, Cuba applied to become an observer an official observer in CARICOM. At the CARICOM's 13 Heads of Government Conference in Trinidad in June 1992, notice, just a month after diplomatic relations were established, the Conference of Heads of CARICOM agreed to establish a joint commission with Cuba to explore the prospects for greater CARICOM-Cuba cooperation in areas of trade development programs and cultural exchanges. They didn't accept the idea of observer status, but to set up a joint commission. The significant decision, this significant decision, to establish the CARICOM Cuba cooperation agreement and the joint commission with Cuba, this significant decision was taken despite the pressure from the American government to persuade CARICOM to the contrary. 
and I want to trace for you how they were doing this. At the time when James Mitchell and Fidel established the relations on behalf of our two countries. The US government, this is my, these are my words, including the Congress, misread entirely CARICOM's mature and non-ideological embrace of Cuba and the prickly independent spirit of CARICOM's leaders and peoples. And we do have a prickly independent spirit of, in our region, and our people have it too. Though CNN and Fox and local politicians hither and thither want to drain us of this prickly independence. Well, I'm a prickly independent fellow. I defend the sovereignty and independence of our country, Caribbean countries, of Cuba, and of Venezuela. You have a right to pursue, pursue what, what system of government that you want. People accept that. And you don't have any right to interfere in their business. You can talk to them, you can work with them, you can try and persuade them, but you cannot talk about regime change. You don't have that right. So when, when I go on, you all can have somebody else who would roll over and play dead, not this man. <laughs> the post-Cold War attempts by the American Congress to tighten the screws on Cuba was seen by CARICOM's leadership as crude, misguided, and even insulting to their elemental sense of what was right and wrong. So when the Torricelli bill, with its extraterritorial trade absurdities against Cuba was passed in Congress and signed into law by President Clinton, CARICOM members' countries stiffened their resolve. I want to pose this question. Are we going to stiffen our resolve against the attempts of some people in the organization of American states to interfere and go for regime change in Venezuela today? I pose that question. I'm talking history, but I come to the present for you to think. So we the leaders stiffened their resolve. This was perhaps best illustrated by the reaction of Eugenia Charles, Prime Minister of Dominica, and an early anti-communist supporter of President Ronald Reagan. And this is what Eugenia said at the time. Quote, I don't think that the embargo should continue. They should let people trade with Cuba if they want to, unquote. Indeed, Prime Minister Eugenia Charles insisted that Dominica would trade with Cuba as long as it remained profitable to do so. She bluntly informed the region as follows, quote, the USA must realize that we in, Caribbean, in CARICOM are independent countries and in the same way that they choose their friends, we must be allowed to choose ours if they haven't realized that the Cold War is over, we have. That's Eugenia. And Eugenia was anti-communist. She was pro-America. Look, I have to use Eugenia to show some current the leaders who have backbone. I'm not using Morris Bishop. In 1993, the heavy hand of the members of the US Congress and White House was again rebuffed. Remember, this is the same whole period, you know, 92, 93. I'm giving you a sense as to what existed, what the Americans were trying to do. 
This time, it concerned CARICOM's decision at its 14th summit in the Bahamas in July 1993 to accept Cuba's insistence on deleting any reference to democracy, human rights, or any similar precondition for cooperation in the draft document of the Cuba CARICOM Joint Cooperation Commission. So they lost the battle in the 13th meeting of CARICOM a year before. CARICOM sets up its, the Joint Commission, sign the cooperation agreement, or have the draft agreement, they agree to it. The U.S. not giving up. Imperialism doesn't give up easily enough. What did they come with next? There was, they were insisting that in this cooperation agreement on trade and other matters, that CARICOM must insist on keeping in the agreement any reference to democracy, human rights, or a similar precondition for cooperation. Cuba said, no, these things, we don't get involved in those things because that'll take us into another conversation. So the U.S. wants to stop it, but using something else. The document which was signed was modeled in similar CARICOM accords with Mexico and Venezuela in which such matters were not raised or included. So the agreement which we had with Venezuela at the time, CARICOM that is, and with Canada, didn't make any reference to any precondition about democracy, human rights, and the like. It's about trade and development, let's do it. The Clinton administration, and by the way, President Clinton is my friend and we work close together on many things of great interest to St. Vincent and Grenadines, including energy. But this is the thing in international discourse. You cooperate and you work with people on which you can work and you don't work with thing, on other things which you can't work with them. You're picking sides in some kind of simplistic manner. The Clinton administration officials had robustly lobbied the CARICOM heads of government conference in the Bahamas to adopt the American approach of utilizing economic levers to compel political concessions from Cuba. These U.S. officials did not succeed. Some of the U.S. Congress were palpably hysterical in their entreaties to CARICOM. Led by the anti-communist crusader against Cuba, Robert Terricelli, the Democratic Senator from New Jersey and the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Western Hemispheric Affairs, several members of the U.S. House of Representatives sent a letter to CARICOM's leaders, threatening to deny their countries any future trade concessions if they did not rescind their decision to delete the human rights provisions from the agreement with Cuba. I want to read the last paragraph of Torricelli's letter, which I have a copy of. What Torricelli said to CARICOM. We had hoped, he is then in the House of Representatives, he subsequently became a senator. Quote, we had hoped that it would be possible to construct a free trade area in this hemisphere based on our country's shared commitment to democratic values. Regrettably, those of us who have promoted this concept in the Congress must now reconsider our support for it. It simply is not possible for us to, to support the extension of trade benefits to the Caribbean region if we believe that the ultimate beneficiary will be the Cuban dictatorship. In other words, they were threatening CARICOM that we ain't going to give you any special trade benefits if you sign that agreement in that way with Cuba. In other words, 
Though the tide of history was against them. You notice how they're still trying to hold the line on pressure car come. You understand why I make the point that despite the 1992 establishment of relations was not a seismic event politically like the one in 1972, it still required courage. What was CARICOM's response? CARICOM stood firm in the face of this thinly veiled economic blackmail. In a cogent, mature response to the authors of the Torricelli letter, CARICOM's distinguished Secretary General at the time, Dr. Edwin Carrington, wrote in his missive of August the 19th, 1993, in part as follows. And permit me to read Carricom, um, Carrington's letter. And I want those who are involved in politics today in government and opposition across the Caribbean. And I want the journalists to hear it. I want the intellectuals to hear it. Because there is some newfangled thing that independence and sovereignty can cast them by the side. And non-interference in the internal affairs of a country can be simply dismissed and waved away. I'm not quoting Bishop. I'm not quoting Fidel. I quoted earlier, I'm not quoting Chetty Jagan. I'm not quoting Ralph. I quote Eugenia, Charles, a right-wing political leader, but a nationalist. And I'm quoting Carrington, who is a middle-of-the-road regional public servant. This is what Carrington said. The basic relationship which the Caribbean community and its member states maintain with Cuba, and which it is not proposed to change. Can be viewed in the same light as those which presently exist between Cuba and other hemispheric countries such as Canada and Mexico. And Mexico had the same kind of an agreements like the one that we are having with Cuba. America, no. Because you're depending on us on some, on some little trade and some little handouts. You got to do what we say. But Carrington was clear. The basic relationship with the Caribbean community and its member states, which we have with Cuba, which we maintain with Cuba, and which it is not proposed to change. You see the point, Yuri? This is why we have to make sure that politicians, both in government and opposition today, we have a basic relationship with Venezuela and we don't intend to change it. CARICOM heads of government, the letter goes on, have noted that Canada in a free trade area with the United States. Canada, sorry, have noted that Canada is in a free trade area with the United States. And also that Canada, Mexico and the United States proposed to launch the North American free trade area NAFTA in January 1994. They therefore find it difficult, that is to say CARICOM leaders, to understand the basis for the concerns that the economic benefits from free trade between the United States and CARICOM will flow through to Cuba from a technical cooperation agreement when that does not occur in the other cases with Canada and Mexico. You don't want it any shorter and sweeter. This very stance was maintained by five nationalist leaders from the Caribbean. Chedi Jagan of Guyana, Erskine Sandiford of Barbados, Patrick Manning of Trinidad and Tobago, P.J. Patterson of Jamaica and Hubert Ingram of the Bahamas in their meeting with President Clinton in Washington on August the 30th, 1993. On December the 13th, 1993, the CARICOM Joint Cuba Commission was established 
at an official sign-in ceremony in Guyana. The American government, which had invested so much time, energy, and resources, political and otherwise, to derail Cuba, this cuba CARICOM agreement had spectacularly failed to do so. CARICOM's fortitude in this matter was grounded in common sense, the interests of the people of Cuba and the Caribbean, and the sensibility of the necessity and desirability of healing the hemispheric fracture with Cuba. The Joint Commission Agreement, renewable every five years, covers a wide range of economic, technical, cultural collaboration, biotechnology, trade, private investment, and tourism. Relevant working groups to implement, implement the agreement were set up. Subsequently, too, Cuba has signed bilateral joint commission arrangements with every CARICOM member state, including ours, to which the permanent secretary and the ambassador referred. And these are splendid examples of mature regionalism. On the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Cuba and the so-called Big Four of CARICOM, the first of the triennial Cuba CARICOM summits convened in Havana, Cuba. 13 of the 14 CARICOM heads, 11 prime ministers and the presidents of Guyana and Haiti were present. Suriname was represented by its vice president. In an article entitled Cuba, CARICOM Cement Ties, and published in the Guyana Chronicle on the 15th of December 2002. The late great Caribbean intellectual, Professor Norman Govan, correctly commented that this inaugural Cuba CARICOM summit, quote, marked a new stage in the consolidation of political and economic relations among these 15 states of the greater Caribbean region, unquote. Henceforth, December the 8th, has been observed as Cuba CARICOM Day. On that occasion, and this was in, 19, in 2002, Fidel declared that the establishment of diplomatic relations, declared that with the establishment of diplomatic relations in December 1972, the four Caribbean countries, quote, were charting the course for what would later become the foreign policy of the Caribbean community characterized until today by three main features, independence, courage, and concerted action, unquote. Those three features identified by Fidel are still central to our CARICOM, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Cuba relations. Independence, courage, and concerted action. In this context, we thank Sir James Mitchell and his government for their action 25 years ago in establishing formal diplomatic ties with Cuba. It would be a good thing for the successors to Sir James and his party to act in concert with that progressive dimension of Sir James's outlook. It is important to note that none of the organized political forces in opposition to the NDP in this country in 1992 opposed the establishment of the formal diplomatic relations with Cuba. The leaderships of the UPM, the Movement for National Unity, and the St. Vincent Grenadines Labour Party all gave support. How different is it today when our government, in the affirmation of our country's sovereignty and independence, broaden and deepen our foreign relations outside of the parameters laid down by the major powers in the North Atlantic? There are organized opposition voices in our country posing the servile query, what would America say? I want to make this point. None of us can live in history. But from history, we can learn lessons for today and for tomorrow, though we can't live in the history. And in learning those lessons, we understand one thing, that of all time, past, present, and future, of all time, only the future is ours 
to the secret. Cuba's opening of formal diplomatic relations with our country was part of its long-standing policy of building friendly relations with countries and peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean, including those in CARICOM. However, renewed vigor was given to this long-standing policy in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the so-called Eastern Bloc of countries in the post-1991 era. The fall of these centrally planned regimes, which paraded under the rubric of communism, occasioned the wrenching dislocation for Cuba in terms of trade, development assistance, military cooperation, and deeply pervasive political interconnections. In Cuba itself, the government under Fidel Castro declared a special period for adjustments and enhanced self-reliance. At the same time, it presaged and was accompanied by a widening bundle of external relations beyond the pre-existing core of the faded and fading regimes in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Thus, a new impetus and emphasis were given to other relations, including those in CARICOM. In the same way that when Chavez came to power, there was a new impetus with Venezuela. The new relations with St. Vincent and the Grenadines were thus part of a ramp-up up, a ramp up of a subset of relations in the wider Caribbean. I want to turn briefly to the relations between our two countries in the first nine years. In December 1993, an agreement establishing the Caribbean-Cuba joint commission was signed, as I've just explained. This agreement provided for the establishment of a commission to promote cooperative relations between CARICOM and Cuba in economic, social, and technological fields. And in the year 2000, a CARICOM-Cuba trade and economic cooperation agreement was signed, which provided for free trade agreements covering hundreds of commodities. Recently, this trade agreement was further expanded. Under both these CARICOM agreements with Cuba, our country has benefited. In 1997, Cuba and SVG entered into a technical cooperation agreement which provided a framework for enhancing cooperation. Through this agreement, a joint commission between our two countries was established as a mechanism to facilitate dialogue on various areas of cooperation and to pursue an effective strategy for deepening of relations, particularly in the fields of education, health, culture, the arts, trade, transportation, telecommunications, and other areas of mutual interest. In the first nine years, May 1992 to March 2001, of Cuba SVG bilateral ties, a small number of university scholarships was taken up by Vincentian students, and a few Cuban doctors were recruited for the health sector. Here, and episodic cultural exchanges occurred, and limited trade flowed. But in this period, people-to-people -people contact between our two countries were given a boost in July 1997, when both countries waived visa requirements for their respective citizens under the reciprocal exemptions of visa agreement for bearers of valid national passports of Cubans in Vincent and the Grenadines. So from 1997, Cubans can come here without a visa, and we can go to Cuba without a visa. Don't know if many of you knew that. At the same time, civil society organizations in our country engage corresponding civil society groupings in Cuba in areas of culture, sports, women, and trade unionism. In this period, too, the SVG Cuba Friendship Society was formed. And in this period, personalities like Renrick Rose, Casper London, Mike Brown, Blazer Williams, Earlene Horn, and yours truly, played important roles in forging stronger SVG Cuba ties. I just want to say this. Important to remember, particularly comrades who are no longer with us. This young lady here, Dr. Horn, who will give the vote of thanks, is Earlene's 
daughter. She studied in Cuba. She's going back there shortly to do postgraduate work in pediatrics. <laughs> Her older sister, Safia, has a master's degree. She's a senior public servant in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. She worked in the regional body, the OECS. Their mother struggled when people in Diamond couldn't see it, when people in Mongrenan couldn't see it, when people in Tong couldn't see it. She struggled as a working class woman so that all her children will get opportunities. That is what you call <laughs> friendship and solidarity. The same thing with Renwick's children and so on and so forth. I, I, but I, I make the point because they're immediately in front of me. I want to look at our relations from 2001 to now. Bear with me. Am, am I boring you? <laughs> to be honest, you know, I'm boring you? Okay, all right, good. The election of the ULP to government on March 20, 2001, and its continued re-election since then, under my leadership, has occasioned a significant strengthening, broadening, and deepening of bilateral cooperation with Cuba and St. Vincent and the Grenadines in all socioeconomic areas and in political discourses. I must just tell you this. It's reached a stage now that when anybody wants to pressure the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in relation to Cuba. They don't come to me. They go to other people and talk to them, talk to Ralph. Because you know the robustness of my response, which would be to them. And the truth of the matter is this. I know I have the arguments on my side, I have the reality on my side. And I'm too old for people to fill my head with Nancy's story. So they'll go and go to other people. But of course, I'm the Prime Minister. The multilateral relationships with, between our two countries have grown closer through particular hemispheric and global organizations, such as ALBA, Petro-Caribe, the Association of Caribbean States, the Community of States of Latin America and the Caribbean, in which Fidel and Chavez and Lula were instrumental, the Non-Aligned Movement, the Alliance of Small Island States and the United Nations. And mutual assistance in forging these bonds have occurred through CARICOM and the OECS. And by way of the instrumentality of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, first under President Hugo Chavez and after his death under President Nicolas Maduro. From very early, Fidel told me, Chavez is a good man. Chavez is a genuine Bolivarian. Chavez defends and supports the principles that we uphold. From the very beginning, in 2001, when I paid my first official visit to Cuba in September 2001. So that the relations are not only what you see, but what leaders share and ideas which emerge. And sometimes, very often, some things you don't talk about. Because if a, law, if a, if a leader talks about everything, he doesn't have many things to talk about. 
because I tell you there's plenty of things that you, you don't talk about. It was expected that when the ULP, which is a progressive social democratic party, came to office, which is nationalist and regionalist and anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist outlook, it was expected that we will deepen our relations, our socio-economic and political ties with Cuba. Everybody expected that. And we were not ashamed, we were not afraid, we also campaigned on that. That was in our manifesto. to tell you this. First, everybody recognize it. Vin the ULP went in opposition under the leadership of Vincent Beach had in 1997 made an official visit to Cuba at the invitation of the ruling Communist Party of Cuba. Vince Beach was not and is not a communist. But he led us. I was part of that delegation. I urged the NDP in opposition to seek to pay an official visit to Cuba at the invitation of the Communist Party of Cuba. They would learn something. And the ULP and the Communist Party of Cuba, we resolve henceforth to work closely with each other in the interests of the people of our respective countries and the oppressed people of our hemisphere and the world. Our party is not a communist party. But it doesn't mean that you can't work with people where you share a range of other ideas and outlook which would be beneficial to you and the people and both countries. Now, and I think that everybody expected that once I became prime minister, I'd be at the forefront of these relations. Everybody knows my background. And I've been going to Cuba from 1976. When everybody was afraid to go to Cuba after the 70 odd persons were killed in the bombing of the Cubana aircraft in October 1976 of Barbados. I went to Cuba in December of that year. People didn't want to go to Cuba. They feel that it's, it's terrible. I went. I took a, 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 I took a youngster with me um, who was just not quite five years old, named Camilo. I took him with me. <laughs> you know, anyway. <laughs> and the evidence has been established that the blowing up of the Cubana plane it's an act of terrorism. There are a number of Venezuelans were involved in that and other Latin Americans. And it was established that the leaders were in cohorts and acting on a terrorist agenda of elements within the CIA. It's established. You know. Decent people all over the world were asking for one of them to be charged. He was going about in the US. They didn't bother to do that. They picked him up on an immigration violation. Not the terrorists. Yet Cuba, which suffered as a consequence of terrorism, has been maintained that they're the state sponsor of terrorism. Within two weeks of the terrorist attacks on the, in the USA, on September 11, 2001, I led a high-level delegation of several cabinet members and business leaders on an official visit to Cuba. 
This visit was arranged weeks before the terrorist attacks. It never crossed our minds in government to postpone the visit. After all, Fidel was swift and strong in his denunciation of the terrorist attacks and had pledged, yet again, Cuba's support in the global flight fight against terrorism. But in St. Vincent, the opposition was timid, the leadership was timid, and they called on me to postpone our visit to Cuba. Because according to the leader then, quote, it sent the wrong signals, unquote. I didn't know what the signals were then, and I'm yet to be told. The official visit to Cuba in September 2001 was a resounding success. Not only was a strong personal chemistry established between Fidel and myself, but more importantly, there were huge practical achievements, particularly in the areas of education, health, culture, sports, trade, and political cooperation. Immediately, over 100 university scholarships of incentions were made available. I'll tell you in the discussions with Fidel, Fidel said, oh, as many? You know how he, the comrade could be expansive, he said, oh, as many as you can bring. Because when I discussed it with the public officials, subsequently said, well, let's start with 100 now. <laughs> Fidel said, you can bring as many as you want. And this included a number of nurses, nursing students, and then 20 trained Cuban nurses, we agreed, were to come to St. Vincent de Grandines, and they came late November, early 2000, early December 2001. Uh, Ariana, wasn't that when you came? One. Yeah, yeah, December 2001. Yeah, December. Yes. Um, incidentally, one of her children is my godchild. Um, people tend to forget this. There was a ter terrible shortage of nurses in 2001 when we arrived in. You know? And we had to get the 21st to help us. And then we began to train them rapidly in our system until now we have a surplus that we export into other places. Then several Cuban doctors, different specialities were sent as part of an ongoing permanent mission. Professionals in the field of agriculture, construction, sports, and land surveying were recruited to assist us. The private sector established useful trade and business contacts. And the leaders fashioned relevant political modalities for ongoing cooperation and dialogue. In the immediate aftermath of this official visit in 2001 and subsequently between then and now, our two countries have entered into several cooperation agreements. In the areas of agriculture, health, transport, uh, and works, energy, airport development, tourism, education, trade, sports, and culture. These have been fashioned within the context of the broader technical cooperation agreement of 1997 and the joint Cuba SVG Commission. Specific projects of huge significance for our development has been, have been undertaken with Cuba's practical and substantial support, including, and I would list, I would list seven of them, because seven is a perfect number. First, the Vision Now program. I heard Ariana said, um, 900, is nearly 2,500 which went to Cuba, and then others subsequently in the mission here. As you know, they received free treatment in Cuba, including the transportation, in collaboration with the government of Venezuela. <laughs> Two. I would, 
I would, I would tell you, I would tell you the story in relation to the first one. And Fidel, Fidel calculated roughly from the averages how many persons he thought would have had problems with their eyes. And uh, I was astounded by the precision when they came to check. He wasn't far off, wrong. And uh, he was like, I mean, it's an experienced revolutionary. But doing this for St. Vincent, incidentally, this was the first country outside of Venezuela. It started in Venezuela. And this was the first country outside of Venezuela that had this program. And typical of the way Fidel would do things, we sent persons for us to do testing. <coughs> then I'm at home one evening at about six o'clock. And I get a call that there's a plane at the airport brought a couple Cuban professionals to get the to get the first batch was 37 to get 37 persons, most of them old people to fix their eyes, to go and fix their eyes. I said, but when is the plane going back? They said, the plane is going back tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. I said, but nobody told us. They said, well, we came so that we can get them. <laughs> so I got, I got Fitz Jones, who was then the hospital administrator, and who had been working on this issue. I contact the commission of police because they had to help us to go and knock on people's doors. <laughs> so Fitz and the police and the, 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 the Cuban who came to help, very busy young man. Subsequently, he became the number two man at the embassy, the Cuban embassy in Mozambique. Yes. Knock on people's um, doors up to 11 o'clock in the night. We decide that we'll concentrate on the leeward side. We couldn't spread ourselves. So barely into, well, south leeward, but mainly central leeward and north leeward were the, were the ones. And the story is that one, which is a fact, one elderly gentleman Blessed memory, now dead. Leopold Anthony. His partner, lady from old lady from Barley, was selected to go. He had also done the checks, but they didn't go for him. He turned up at the airport to to go to Cuba. He had only his Close on and his violin. One of his daughters came by the airport and heard it. He said, But how you can go? What you, you close? He said, No, 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 no. Ralph and Fidel say that you can go to Cuba. They'll find clothes for me in Cuba. <laughs> she, said, she said, No, 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 no. Um, so he used to stay sometimes by them in Arnesville. That's the, by a former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alpian Allen. And he will keep a change of pants and short there and they put them in a, in a grip <laughs> and took it there. It would have been lovely if you have him. It, there's a film with him, you know. When he arrived in Cuba, he left the, the, we were be, the, the plane was being welcomed by musicians. He left and went across with them and started. He said, 
I said, but this, he said, no, 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 I told him I have my fiddle, I want to play. <laughs> and and he, he played one Tanamera with, with the Cuban band. There are many, many beautiful stories to be told, but I mean, I'm, that's for another time when we sit down and, but I, I am dealing with the, the formal stuff to provide the context, but a lot of lovely human interest stories, including stuff between Fidel and myself. I mean, it's just, and Raul, oh, who is very funny. The, to give you the, the, the extent of um, Raul's humor, I saw Raul after I'd visited Pope Francis in December 2013. So I was, we were talking about the visit when the Pope told me, I asked the Pope, we were talking, I said, tell me about Fidel. What do you think of Fidel? He paused, pondered, he said, Ralph, I think that Fidel is a believer. Very interesting. So I was telling Raoul the story. And Raoul says, well, you know, the Pope is a Jesuit, and so Jesuits can get it wrong, you know. <laughs> He's joking. So I said, well, give me, give me a story about where the, Jesuit got it, where the Jesuits got it wrong before. He said, I'll tell you this. There was a Jesuit in charge of the school which his father had sent him to, he and Fidel, a boarding school. Raoul said he loved it, I mean, that Fidel loved it and he, Raoul, hated it. And he was, Raoul said he was full of mischief, all he wanted to do was to leave the place. He said, he got his wish. The Jesuit head of the school expelled him. And in the letter to his father, he said, I will show you in one letter, this Jesuit priest made two errors. So I said, what are these? He wrote in the letter as to, about Raoul, he told Raoul's father in the letter that nothing good would ever come of this boy. So that is the first thing. He said, well, he was clearly wrong about that. <laughs> and the second one, if only he could be like his older brother Fidel, who is so respectful of authority. <laughs> so Raoul said, Fidel, respectful of authority. <laughs> anyway, there are many stories, but I'll go through the seven. So the first one was vision now. The second one. A mission was sent to track and treat persons with disabilities, and out of this, the Life to Live program has evolved. Thirdly, the Energy Saving Light Bulb Initiative of 35 to 35,000 homes. You remember what the opposition was saying at the time? That keep people out because they, 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 they have camera inside of the bulb. You remember that? And it inspired. Fourth, the training free of course to medical personnel and the provision of the drug Herbaprot P at a preferential rate for the treatment of incentions who have diabetic foot ulcers. I want to tell you a story about this. First of all, we are the only country in CARICOM that has this program. This program so far has saved dozens of Vincentians their limb. Because when you have a diabetic foot ulcer at a particular stage, the solution is to cut off your foot. But there's this drug. Now, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health didn't read the fine print properly about Obama's opening up of relations with Cuba. So we got the, the invoice for the drugs. The money is available. The Ministry of Health goes to 
the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to send the money to Cuba, to the Biotechnology Institute. Well, even though Cuba is no longer a state sponsor of terrorism, that particular location is still on the quote-unquote blacklist. And in any event, you just can't send money. So, so we, the money is sent to the bank of, through our corresponding bank, the Bank of America. And when you reach the Bank of America, they seized the money. They seized it. And we had to wait until we had to fight and the bank until the State Department, the Treasury Department, sorry, gave the okay in the U.S. to release that money. In the meantime, patients were waiting and we had to send another set of money before we got back that one to, through the bank in Canada, a corresponding bank in Canada to send the money to Cuba. And that is how we were able to get the drug to pay for it through the Canadian bank. There are many stories, you know. Then, the structured exchange, 50 structured exchange programs in culture and the arts, including our participation at the Havana International Book Fair, René Batiste pushed these things. The construction of the $40 million modern medical, modern medical complex at Georgetown to be opened shortly. Cuba provided technical staff and substantial equipment, medical equipment, and will provide ongoing medical personnel. And of course, the Argyle International Airport. Without Fidel and Raul, and Chavez and Maduro, there'll be no airport. And they have been with us from start to finish. The institutional strengthening of Cuba SVG relations was fortified in the period after 2005 with the appointment of ambassadors here and in Cuba, and that was told. Then there are the personal links, and, and we have been going there. I have been going very frequently. Cuban ministers have been coming. Unfortunately, Fidel wanted to come, but the airport didn't open in time. I'm hoping that Raul will come, but he had sent on February the 14th this year. He sent the Vice President of the Council of State of Cuba to participate in the activities, opening for the formal opening of the AIA. And I've been told I'm, I'm permitted to announce that as from June the 5th, twice weekly, the Easy Sky Airline will ply a jet service from Havana to Argyle Return. <laughs> this is a jet service. Undoubtedly, this would open up trade, tourism, cultural, and sporting opportunities for both countries. In time, investment opportunities would be realized. I just want to say that Cuba gave pretty early the permission for Easy Sky to come the route and ECA and Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority and our transport board, air, tran air licensing transport board also, they have given permission. The Easy Sky has also applied for registration in our jurisdiction. That process will take a little longer. The reason for that, if they get registration in our jurisdiction, because we are a category one, jurisdiction, they'd be able to fly directly to the United States of America also. But that's part of the process which you just have to be working on all the time. Now, in, in my final comments, it is clear that both countries have benefited immensely. But the stark truth is that the extraordinary selflessness and solidarity of the Cuban government and people have contributed hugely to our socio-economic development. And as Sir Louis Straker said in the film, Cuba gave us 
not out of the extras which they have, but they have given us from the little which they have, which is the hallmark of solidarity. Even when they had this special period and great difficulty, they continued to assist us and educate hundreds of our students. I want to say this too. Venezuela was helpful to us with Petrocaribe and Alba. When oil was 148 US dollars a barrel in 2008, July, when it goes down below 50, below $40, it's back up at 50 or there about now, they have not brought to an end the petro Caribe Agreement. Again, I want to thank Venezuela for their solidarity. <laughs> Never on one single occasion has Cuba ever brought any pressure on my government to influence or persuade it to adopt or amend any political posture contrary to our own settled policy and strategic outlook. Cuba has been very respectful of our sovereignty and independence, as we have been of theirs, and Cuba has been an exemplary partner for our country. Moreover, Cuba has been an interlocutor on, the, on our behalf. I know Fidel has spoken to Venezuela, to Chavez to help us to Ecuador, to Rafael Correa. In all of this, Fidel and Raul have provided sterling leadership of the highest quality. We thank them and we thank the Cuban government and people. The bonds between our two countries are unbreakable. We are components, we are active contingents of our Caribbean civilization. And we are resolved to uplift further our civilization and all humanity. I expect that both our countries will consolidate, deepen, and broaden ever more perfectly our relations of solidarity and love over the next 25 years. Thank you.